Hey there. How are you? Hey, there we go. I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. Very good. Good to meet you. Yeah, same to you. Welcome and thank you for coming. Oh, my pleasure. How are things in New Hampshire? <laughs> they are uh, cloudy and, and a little chilly. That's kind of the same here. You know? uh, now, so where are you right, right now? I, right now I'm in Oklahoma. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, finishing up my, my last semester at the University of Oklahoma and I'm gonna be moving to Hillsdale College yeah, uh, I saw that. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think I think it's going to be a good move. I I'm uh, I'm very uh, hopeful about it. I'm supposed to be the God, hope guy. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I I think uh, they're doing so many great things. And mm. I did. You may you may or may not know. I did an online course with them based mm -hmm. on uh, Land of Hope, and it's been a great success. And so. Um, one of the things Larry Arn wants to do is is to do more online courses and uh, and to work with wants me to work with his charter school system. The, oh wow, uh, Bar Barney schools, which I'm very interested in. You know, it's funny I uh, had very little interest in K twelve education until until I realized how how much trouble we're in, <laughs> in what 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 our kids are learning. So uh, uh, and not learning. You know? Yeah it's almost more that what they're not learning than what they are learning. But, uh, yeah. That, well, that's one of the things that we'll, we'll get into when we talk about Land of Hope that um, yeah. was, it, there was a lot of stuff that you've included in this that was never in any of my textbooks in high school or college. Well, and you know, that's, that's interesting you say that because at the same time, I, I felt one of the hardest things about the book was deciding uh, how much to leave out because if you got if you put in everything including the kitchen sink you're going to have an incoherent mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately boring book which is what most history textbooks are just mind-numbingly boring because there's no narrative flow to them yeah. there's no uh, focus uh, and some of that means you just have to leave out things things that may even be important but they're uh, they're not uh, not everything is of equal weight and, uh, you know, kind of get, conveying a sense of the, of the national story of what we're about. It seems to me was the, the most important thing to try to get across. And, it, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that makes the book different. So, uh, but uh, we'll, we, I assume we'll talk about all that. Shortly. Yeah. How long is the interview? Um, as long as you want to go, uh, yeah, about, about, about 20, 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. I, look, I'm, I, 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 you, you, uh, you shouldn't make it as long as I want to go because <laughs> you're at seven o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Some of our, um, we, we've had a couple of these go, um, go long because the, the guest had, had time and, and just yeah. kept talking and people dropped out as they needed to. But yeah. Uh, but we we shoot for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, okay. 40, 45, a lot of people go for around 40, 45, um, depending on just, you know, how interesting the conversation is and, and who um, is asking questions in the chat. That's yeah. Right. So um, it's not like we have a, a, a short subject here. So. No, that's right. You can go on as long as as, as is thinkable. But can you tell me, uh, give me a, a, the elevator speech on the Bartlett uh, Institute? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and um, yeah, I, th I think pretty much everybody in our chat uh, will be familiar with us, but the Josiah Bartlett Center is the free market think tank uh, in New Hampshire. So we're the, uh, we're the affiliate here of the State Policy Network. Um, right. And um, comparable to our Oklahoma Council on uh, what, what is it? So OCPA, Public Affairs. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, similar. And um, so we do research on public policy in New Hampshire, specific to New Hampshire. And our approach is to take a, a limited government free market view of these things and make policy recommendations to, to policymakers. Yeah. To, um, you know, to lay off the regulations, lay off the taxation, show them yeah. ways to do it in a free market way. Well, you know, New Hampshire used to be uh, 
you know, stand, be a standout in New England in that regard. Are, are you still? I mean, it seems as if, you know, the invasion of Massachusetts uh, refugees and other yeah. things. Have, uh, we are. Some uh, of that. And in, in one of the interesting things that I actually um, have written about a lot over the last 20 years before I got to Bartlett even, um, the Massachusetts refugees have actually trended a lot more anti-tax and a lot more Republican than the okay. than a many re, um, other parts of the state, and because they tend to come here to flee high taxes. So yes. if you look at the most Republican and most anti-tax voting towns in New Hampshire, they concentrate along the southern border with Mass. Those really. The, the, uh, we have a lot of people from Massachusetts who have moved to New Hampshire. A lot of them still have their jobs in Boston and, and suburbs, but they came here because they want to pay lower taxes and they vote for lower taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, thankfully, we, we still we got that influx of Massachusetts tax refugees. Um, we have a lot of folks who come here from mid-Atlantic states and other states um, for jobs, and they tend to keep their politics. So they're not necessarily uh -huh. voting anti-tax. So, uh, so New Hampshire is still, um, it's still a little island of fiscal restraint in New England, not quite to the degree it used to be, but it, it still is. And, and one of the reasons is that our success, our economic success over the last 40, 50 years has been noticed. And uh -huh. uh, Massachusetts, you know, a series of Republican governors there really got tired of being called Taxachusetts, and they put in a lot of tax cut measures. Yeah. And their income tax now is competitive with a lot of southern states. Um, they're being very aggressive about it, and so um, we've lost a little bit of that edge because other people noticed our success and said, "Wait a minute, we got to copy what they're doing." Yeah. yeah. Do, do you still not have sales tax? Uh, yeah, no, no sales tax, um, no income tax. Yeah. Technically, we do have an income tax on interest and dividends, uh, but we don't have a yeah. wage income tax. So, um, but you know, a lot of other states, we, our last um, person we had doing one of these events pointed out um, a lot of Southern and Western states now are, are eliminating their income taxes, eliminating their interest and dividends taxes and yes. um, competing with New Hampshire. So it, I, I, yeah, I lived in Tennessee for a number of years and uh, they had what they called the hall tax, which was <laughs> a, a dividends, uh, 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 you know, and the capital gains, uh, it, it, it was complicated what, what exactly it was, but they got rid of it after I left, of course. But uh, uh, yeah, and so you're right. It, it's, it's uh, uh, of course, I, I, I assume property taxes are pretty high uh, they are. Uh, property taxes are fairly high, but um, but your overall tax burden is lower. So, you know, that's that's the overall benefit here. But um, yeah, so we, we pursue uh, free market stuff, but we also have an interest uh, in civil discourse and in civics um, and in history. And part of that just stems from our namesake, Josiah Bartlett, um, obviously, you know, uh, Patriot Declaration of Independence signer, um, yeah, Governor of New Hampshire. So, uh, but but also, you know, our view of government is that it we have a representative government where people are supposed to meet in assembly and discuss and debate, and so you need a basic fundamental level or foundational level of civic discourse in order to make that work. And so, yeah, and we do have yeah. a an interest in um, these civic discussions and, and American history is an important one now. So um, we have uh, a good number of folks in the meeting. We'll probably have a few more trickle in. So I'm gonna go ahead and get okay. us officially started. Uh, so I wanna welcome everybody um, to our talk today. And I um, appreciate uh, Dr. McClay for, for being here with us. And I wanna show you for those, uh, everybody here is, knows what the talk is, but this is the book, Land of Hope. It's probably showing up backwards on the computer. No, it's not. It's not backwards on my my okay. screen. <laughs> um, so it is. Uh, here, if we can do it, do it in stereo. We can. Oh, now, see, mine does come backwards, at least on my. Oh yeah, I know it looks good. Um, All right. All right. And, and the reason we're doing this talk today is because um, there's been a lot of obviously from lots of different sources over the past couple of years, 
um, criticisms of uh, America and of US history and labeling it all kinds of things and um, different competing political views of American history. And um, this new book is a textbook. It's a high school textbook. And it is, um, I, I, I will um, read from somebody else who's spoken to the Josiah Barlow Center. The very first blurb in Land of Hope is from Gordon Wood, the Pulitzer winning historian who we had at our very first civic discourses event a couple years ago uh, to talk to us. And um, he, he calls this a, a brilliant new history written in lucid and often lyrical prose and much needed, accurate, honest, and free of unhistorical condescension, which I thought that was a wonderful way to put it. And uh, so that's why we had Dr. McClay here today to talk about this book and, you know, about a historical revisionism and about what is the right way to look at American history to make sure you're understanding it accurately, um, you know, warts and all. And so I want to start off this conversation with a talk of the title of the book, which I thought was great. And I love the way you introduce the book and the subject by you know, titling America a land of hope and talking about the different types of people who came here. And I wonder if we can just tee it off with that discussion. Why did you come up with that title and what do you mean? Yeah, and when I, and you know, that's a great question in, in part because it was the first thing I wrote uh, about in the book. I, I uh, usually you write the title last or, mm -hmm. or you, you, and you sort of fool around with, with it, uh, with the publisher. I, I had the idea of Land of Hope uh, as the title right from the start. I pinned it to my computer monitor, and uh, uh, and and I also pinned uh, something else. I'd like to read uh, at some point to your to your audience a, a, a epigraph by John Dos Passos that really guided my thinking mm -hmm. about the book. Uh, but um, yeah, the the uh, Land of Hope because I think to understand America. And, and to understand America properly. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that quote from Gordon Wood, whenever I'm feeling glum, I look at it again. And, and uh, he's, I, I, of all, I think he's the greatest living historian of the United States uh, and certainly one of the greatest uh, that we've ever had. And uh, I, I'm privileged to know him a little bit uh, although not enough to, for, to have influenced his blurb, and uh, so, but I feel very good about that, and 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 that's what I really I wanted uh, to for young people to present. Yes, warts and all, um, but a but not not only warts, <laughs> not yes. uh, uh, excessively focusing on the warts, but but seeing it all in a better and more capacious perspective. That's what I think is missing from a lot of the revisionism. That uh, uh, you know, and, and and the most egregious example of which is Howard Zinn's mm -hmm. book, uh, *People's History of the United States*, which has sold, I think, four million copies. Um, that's a lot of copies of a history book, and it's used in many schools. Um, and it's a history of, of America as a, a, a history of atrocities and injustices, and uh, a, a history in which always uh, the, the, what, what other historians would call progress is always the bad guys triumphing over the good ones and, and grinding them into the, into the ground. And this is just a, 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 a gross distortion of, of our history, uh, built on, in some cases on, on things that are actual falsehoods, but in many cases, not so much that as half truth or things that are, that are rendered out of context. And history is the art of properly contextualizing the things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to, uh, for just to use an obvious example that comes up all the time, to use, to look at the framers, the founders uh, through the lens of 21st century expectations about politics is uh, really to commit a, a cardinal sin of failing to understand the past uh, on its own terms, first and foremost, and, and viewing the past as a gi giant shooting gallery in which you get to take aim uh, at whatever you displeases you and take it down um, and, uh, and, and, and judge it. Um, I think uh, 
this is I, what, what Gordon Wood calls the condescension mm -hmm. that we have towards the past, that we are so much better than they were. And, that, and, and, and yet we're going to judge them according to the expectations that we in an, an industrial and, and highly developed society have for ourselves. And that's just simply uh, wrong. Uh, we can talk more about specific issues like slavery, uh, but, but uh, which of course the 1619 project has, has uh, brought out, uh, although it did not need to be brought to our attention. We, we all, historians have always uh, known about and written about uh, slavery. You couldn't explain the coming of the Civil War without it. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's a question of how do you properly contextualize that and uh, again we can come back to that if you like but uh, I, I, I think hope to get back to your question why hope well hope is a uh, is I think a quality that is almost uniquely predominant in the American ethos and and what I mean by hope is it, you could, the hope is a theological term hope can be um, a uh, but uh, strictly material hope of of improving your lot in life, but uh, it's an aspirational quality. It's 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 the belief that uh, whatever the conditions we have been born into are not uh, the conditions we are contemned to live in for the rest of our lives. We we have possibilities. We have opportunities. We have ways of rising in the world and of of changing the trajectory that we're on. This is, uh, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. America being a land of hope sometimes means that it's a, a land of disappointment. And that, that's the way it is. Not every startup business succeeds. Not every uh, immigrant was happy with what he or she found. Uh, you know, th these, this is part of our story too. But it's that opportunity that is, is and that sense that life offers or should offer an opportunity to rise, that aspirational quality. That I think is very, very deep in the marrow of, of, of American life. And I don't, I don't see it going away anytime soon. So we're a land, uh, a country uh, that is built on and around this sense that uh, our prospects are, if not unlimited, we're not, they're not defined by who our father was. They're not defined by, the socioeconomic circumstances in which we were born. That's why people got into boats and made the perilous crossing of the Atlantic or the Pacific in some cases uh, because of opportunity beckoning and the willingness uh, to take a chance. Uh, so uh, that, that's, I, I felt hope, hope was a term that needed to be in the title. Land needed to be in the title too, because we're not just, I, I really take issue with the notion that America is best understood as an idea. I think we are an idea and, we, and, and I, I don't disagree with that, but we're also a land. We're also a people. We also have a history, a shared history, shared memories. Um, and we have a story. My subtitle is an invitation to the great American story. And uh, uh, that's for young people. I want them to, to see that there is a story here. It's it, it and it's a great story. It's an inspiring story. It's a story that they need to enter into and participate in, to carry it to the next stage. But they they don't need to reinvent the world to do that. They they need to kind of grasp hold of what is rightly theirs of their inheritance. Hello? <laughs> Have I lost you? I think I've lost. Ah. Well, are the, uh, could you, use of you in the audience, can you indicate whether you, uh, I'll look at the chat box and see if there's, can you indicate if you, 
Yeah, you're saying I still seeing you don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, why don't I? I'll tell you what. I'm going to continue because I do have this passage that I want to read to you. It's from the you know the, <laughs> the book, uh, and uh, it's it's the epigraph. And you know the epigraph is the thing uh, that uh, the quotation usually it's just a, like a sentence uh, that you find in many books uh, uh, ahead of the after the title page, but ahead of the table of contents. And uh, I decided, I, well, because I love this quotation, uh, to have an extended epigraph. Uh, so uh, you'll, you'll see here, so this is the page. It's a long epigraph, but let me, let me read it to you. I'll, and I'm going to read the whole thing because uh, it's, I think it speaks, speaks exactly to our situation. Um, John Dos Passos, some of you will know who he is, a uh, uh, somewhat forgotten figure, but he was an American, great American novelist of the 20th century, uh, a really wonderfully experimental writer. And when he was young, a, a strong uh, leftist, I think we could say a communist, um, uh, but who shifted. Um, and by, uh, by the 40s, uh, he was... Uh, he, he was really on his way to be becoming a conservative, although I would say that he was someone who was always concerned with liberty um, uh, more than he was with, with uh, sort of traditionalism or anything like that, that, that sense of conservatism. But, okay, let me read you. This is from an essay he wrote. I'll, I'll tell you when he wrote it after I read it. Okay. Every generation rewrites the past. In easy times, history is more or less of an ornamental art. But in times of danger, we're driven to the written record by a pressing need to find answers to the riddles of today. We need to know what kind of firm ground other men belonging to generations before us have found to stand on. In spite of changing conditions of life, they were not very different from ourselves. Their thoughts were the grandfathers of our thoughts. I love that, the grandfathers of our thoughts. They managed to meet situations as difficult as those we have to face, to meet them sometimes lightheartedly and in some measure to make their hopes prevail. We need to know how they did it. And one more paragraph here. In times of change and danger, when there's a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, a sense of continuity with generations gone before can stretch like a lifeline across the scary present and get us past, past that idiot delusion of the exceptional now that blocks good thinking. That's why in times like ours, when old institutions are caving in and being replaced by new institutions, not necessarily in accord with most men's preconceived hopes, political thought has to look backwards as well as forwards, okay. This is from an essay that Dos Passos wrote called The Use of the Past. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you when, uh, Drew, you're back. Welcome. Uh, I'm uh, back. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. We, we've just kept on going, you know. Uh, <laughs> Good. And I, I just read uh, the, the epigraph to the book, which Good. is uh, really wonderful. And I didn't write it, but, but I chose it but, <laughs> by John Dos Passos. And it's from this essay, The Use of the Past. It was written, published in 1941, in the early part of 1941. And, and that, that's why, you know, here's a guy saying, you know, we have this tendency to think, uh, that this idiotic tendency, he calls it, to think in terms of the exceptional now, that what's happening right now has no precedent. And so nothing in the past can teach us anything about, about what, what we face today. And he's saying that's nonsense. And that what one of the things we absolutely need to think clearly is that sense of the past as a lifeline across the scary present. Um, so he, he's uh, in 1941, he's saying it's 1941. Nine, and this is before Pearl Harbor. This is early 1941. Uh, Hitler is in control of continental Europe. Uh, only the British Isles holding out and feebly so the United States staying out at least officially of the war. Um, and on the home front, the nation 
our nation furiously divided over the issue of whether we should involve ourselves. Still, uh, in, in this, these, these dire circumstances when civilization itself uh, was on the ropes, uh, or so it seemed. So uh, this is, he, he was not writing this during some tranquil time when uh, there was nothing to do but sit around and watch the daffodils grow and the, and the bumblebees course around. It, it, this is a, one of the key moments in modern history in which everything, all the chips were on the table. And here's this guy saying, we need to look back. We need to look backward to the past for, for inspiration, for solace, for uh, consolation, and for strength. So, uh, what, what we're we're living in anxious times. It's you know, cliche to say, but it's true. But surely, uh, whatever anxieties we have, um, don't compare to the rightful anxieties that Americans and others had about the state of the world in 1941. So. Um, well, that I wanna... gives some weight to what Das Despasos is saying. Now, Drew, I'm going to let you get in on my show here. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, um, so I, I wanted to just briefly, um, and I, I think we'll get to, I want to do questions at the end. So I said some folks are um, eager to ask some questions. I want to do a, um, a quick rundown of some of the points you make in the book first. Um, you may cover some of these same topics. So one of the things that... Um, that you covered in the book that I don't think that this was not in my um, high school or any of my college uh, textbooks. We got into it at higher levels of college, but you talked about um, the Spanish and French versus English settlements in the U.S. in the in North America, and I just wonder really quickly. Um, would you mind just giving us a, a brief rundown? There's, there was a real difference between the way the English settlers and, um, or the way the English settled, I should say, the their colonies and what their intent was and how they viewed the New World versus the Spanish and French. And I just wonder if you guys, a very quick overview of that difference, which might explain some of um, the development of those areas, of those colonies. Yeah, I mean, uh, to very much simplify it but not oversimplify it that the Spanish and the French uh, both operated from a kind of mercantilist um, uh, perspective economically speaking and that they they sought colonies in order to enrich the mother country um, often strictly by you know finding precious metals and, and exploiting them um, and 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 thus uh, uh, um, uh, and and favoring the economy all the, to the extent that it um, developed a favorable balance of trade uh, as according to mercantilist principles they wanted to do. Um, the English um, had a, an entirely different approach. It was really mu much more liberal in the best sense of the word, much more free, freedom oriented, more um, willing to let each um, uh, colonists, uh, whether they were operating as, as a sort of private individuals or as part of a chartered company, it uh, uh, was a royal charter uh, or whatever arrangements, joint stock companies, they, 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 there, was a, there was a whole panoply of different ways of going about it. But to try different things and to sort of operate on their own. So that from the very beginning in Massachusetts and in Virginia, both you have uh, colonial assemblies that um, take on themselves uh, the task of, de of determining taxation and, and other sort of fundamental elements of public policy. In other words, uh, the English colonies were allowed to rule themselves. Uh, and some of this was because the British, uh, the English Brit slash British, uh, by the 18th century, as we're typically afraid to say British, um, um, were so preoccupied with their own internal struggles over what what the monarchy was going to look like, whether they would tip over into absolutism as uh, Spain and France had, or whether they would have a constitutional uh, monarchy, which is, of course, what ended up happening, much to our benefit. Uh, but they were so preoccupied with these struggles that they didn't try to sort of uh, micromanage 
the colonies, which was very difficult to do anyway with the state of communications and transportation. So as a consequence, these co the, the English slash British colonies developed much more independently with more freedom, more ability to be entrepreneurial, uh, to try new things uh, and, uh, and uh, just kind of go their own way. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, they prospered. And uh, uh, the other thing, and you use the term settler, which is important, uh, they, uh, they, the, 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 well, particularly the Puritans, the, the New England colonists and the Middle Atlantic colonists, uh, they brought women and children, they brought families. Uh, they came to establish you know, permanent, enduring, viable human settlements with thriving economies and that, that with, with an ability to be self-sufficient. Virginia is a little different. Virginia uh, started out uh, rather poorly with uh, gentlemen adventurers who didn't know the first thing about establishing a colony and they all nearly died off. Uh, eventually uh, they discovered tobacco and tobacco of all things became the salvation of Virginia. So Virginia has a, a number of the, these sort of originating sins <laughs> clouding the picture comparing compared to New England or, or the middle states, but uh, middle colonies, I should say. Um, well, we have a Virginian and, Indians, and I think he needs to hear that. But yeah. that, that, that Virginia really screwed up Jamestown for, for a long time. Yeah. They got it right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's the contrast. Is it, it's a contrast between you know uh, centralized, top down. You know, it's a very familiar thing. Centralized, top down, uh, micromanagement designed to exploit the colonies for the sake of the really the metropolitan power, the, the, right. the mother country, and and a more dispersed power that figured that. Uh, um, that people would uh, do well uh, do well by being allowed to go their own way and, and prosperity. Right. And, and that, that I think is, um, so you have a chapter um, early on uh, once you get through that about self-rule. And I yeah. think that's really important. I just wanna get, I don't wanna dwell um, entirely on that era, but I, I think this is really central. So when I was growing up, I learned, and I, I hear this still echoing today, that the American Revolution was about taxes. It was about you know the tea tax and the Boston Tea Party. And when you get into this, um, you learn that that's not really true, um, and that it was that self rule. And you set the stage beautifully. Um, the colonies were weird. Every single colony had its own government, its own way of doing things, its own people, and they all could basically govern themselves. And over time, um, the culture in the English colonies was one of self-rule. And then after the French and Indian War, um, when the, the mother country started to say, wait a minute, okay, now we've got to get our this money back. Uh, we're yeah. going to tax you, but we're also going to assert our authority over you. So can you just talk a little bit about that culture of self-rule and how that sort of led to the revolution and, and uh, the days after? Yeah, well, of course, there's a lot of theories about what was behind the American Revolution. It's sure. it's a, it's a it's more than a cottage industry. It's a whole uh, sort of uh, uh, city block of <laughs> heavy industry. Uh, and uh, and 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 I chose in this book not to wade into that, but to simply bring it down to the most basic things that that all or most of the theories have in common. Um, and uh, that is uh, a, a fear of fear of centralized power, a fear of mo of of what a tyrannical monarch might do, uh, and a tyrannical central government. This informed the the Constitution, the drafting of the Constitution, the debates about the Constitution, um, and, and a desire not to replicate the mistakes that were made by Great Britain that led to the Revolution, but. Uh, what I would say, you know, you, you, I like the word weird. You know, there's a, there's a kind of uh, quilt, crazy quilt pattern of the colonies, you know, ranging from the, you know, the Puritans, a sort of uh, almost, not quite exactly theocratic, but almost theocratic community to Virginia, uh, which I've already described, so in New York, uh, com very commercial, uh, Philadelphia, uh, you know, Quakers, 
uh, been dominant for a while, but much, much diversity, much ethnic diversity. Georgia, a uh, kind of utopian community that uh, uh, for uh, debtors and, and, and other, I mean, it's amazing uh, variety in these colonies. And it, it, it's not um, entirely foreordained that they would come together uh, for this cause. I think the French and Indian War helped to create, I mean, part of what the, your question is, what, how do you see the forging of a national consciousness yeah. among these disparate colonies? And they do have a lot in common. They're mainly English speaking. They're, they, they're mainly uh, come out of the same religious traditions, although some in Virginia was Anglican and, uh, and, and uh, Massachusetts was congregational. And all those, the, there were evangelical currents here and, and traditional currents there. But, um, but it was basically the same heavily Protestant. Uh, Maryland started out as Catholic, but didn't really stay that way. Um, well, one so of the that you, there's a lot of cultural similarity, but still something was needed to galvanize it. French and Indian War, just, just quickly to, yeah. to kind of pick up on your point, um, Britain had to spend a lot of money to settle that thing. <laughs> and it was a great victory over the French, their arch rival, the French. It, put, it basically put the French out of business in the new world, um, but at a huge cost. And this is why uh, the, the, the parliament, uh, it's much more the parliament than the king, starts looking at, well, we need that, we need, you know, the, these guys, the, these colonists should be paying for their fair share. We defended them. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not an entirely unjust, not at all. I mean, I, I think you study the history and you become a little more impressed by the validity of the British case. But these were people who were used to ruling themselves uh, in their provincial assemblies. And so they, they, uh, 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 you know, that love of self-rule, that being accustomed to self-rule, um, it, it becomes a, a, a unifying principle. And so that when, uh, particularly when Massachusetts is sort of made an example of um, uh, numerous times, uh, um, the, other, the other colonies begin to rally around and uh, the committees of correspondence form. And, you know, there's a, a gradual knitting together of, of the colonies in common cause. Although even then, um, uh, it, it the whole all the debates over the Constitution, the anti-federalists, who had a much better case than than your high school history textbook <laughs> depicted them as having, uh, they were reluctant to to uh, move in the direction of what they call consolidation. Um, that's a really strong element in our founding. That sort of drawing away from the idea that we should be a consolidated government mm -hmm. instead should be a federal one or, or confederation. Uh, uh, in which the individual elements retain as much autonomy as possible, as much freedom as possible. Yeah, um, and one of the things that, that you uh, mentioned, I just wanted to make sure we touched briefly is, um, uh, and you talked about, you know, Maryland intending to be Catholic, Pennsylvania intending to be Quaker, Georgia intending to be, you know, a reform school for debtors, basically. And, um, and that you had a lot of colonies and, and Massachusetts was uh, going to be a Puritan place, um, Rhode Island, they were intended as certain experiments or um, to be homes for certain types of people. And almost immediately that failed in the sense that yes. once yes. you opened it up, um, once people were free to do what they wanted and to move where they wanted, the intentions of the founders of those colonies were immediately scrapped and people just did what they wanted. <laughs> And yeah, a unique feature or an, a, a feature that was common across all these different experiments of trying to create all these utopias or various things. And, the, you know, so even when colonies try to top down kind of approach to say, we're going to be this way, uh, that just as soon as people were free to do what they want, that went out the window. Yeah. Well, of course, there's a notorious attempt on the, in the Hudson Valley to establish these sort of um, feudal style institutions with the patroons and large estates. And, you know, that was just a complete flop. That was never going to fly in a country where people could always go west and, uh, and there was land available. Uh, this is what happened in, in Massachusetts in the small town. There are wonderful series of, 
of, of town studies that show how places like Andover and Dedham and others say, you know, uh, the next generation comes up and you don't have primogeniture in America, you don't have entail, uh, the, the estate gets divided up uh, and, and some who want to seek their fortune will go, go west. And uh, so that there's a natural sort of uh, centrifugal force operating that, that, that uh, tended towards expansion, tended towards the westward movement and, and, and broke down utopian experiments. Uh, and and we, get, we got a different kind of society as a result. But I think it's really important that as is part of being a land of hope is that, you know, I quote early on in the book, Daniel Borston said, it says that the, you know, the early colonies were kind of a catalog of failed utopian experiments. Right. And in a way it's true, every single one of them failed on its own terms. Um, Massachusetts probably did a better job than certainly Georgia. I mean, Georgia was just a complete disaster in, 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 in the terms of the original colony. But um, uh, the ability to try these things, yeah. uh, to experiment, that's, and, and even when they fail, and that's that, that experimentalism in, in social organization is something that, that, that has been a part of us. And, you know, in ways that, uh, that, that are reflective of a, a fundamental commitment to freedom. Well, I, and, that, and that is a great opportunity to talk about something I think is on the minds of a lot of people. Um, and you touched on it briefly, but just to really quickly talk about, um, you know, just as an example, the 1619 Project, and there's a whole effort that's not the only one. There's a whole movement to redefine America as inherently racist, that's founded on racism, is founded on privilege and elitism and keeping certain segments of the population down and oppressed. And I just wonder if you can address that in a big picture um, takeaway, but also um, one of the things that you mentioned as a specific example in your book was, which again, um, it's wonderful to have these, you know, to have a historian who's writing from this different perspective than what we normally get. So you put in your book, an example of how you shouldn't look back with today's lenses um, to talk about the, um, the franchise and um, how, okay, when we look back at, at the colonial era, the founding era with our point of view, we see that Native Americans and blacks and women were not allowed to participate. And yet, given the way the rest of the world was at the time, the what became the United States um, had the largest franchise in the world. We had more participation than any place else on the planet at that time. So when you compare it to the norm at the time, it was truly radical and ex extending the franchise, extending uh, self-rule to more people than anywhere else in the world was doing it. So can, can you just you know, address those sort of big picture uh, topics really briefly? That, that, that's really such a great point. I mean, one of the things in, in teaching, I, you know, and you often get pushed back about these things and it often quite mindless, you know, the students, I call it the new default. Um, yeah. You know, back when I was in school, you know, when you didn't know the answer, you, you give what I call the stars and stripes forever question. Well, the reason Andrew Jackson engaged in a war against the National Bank was because he believed America was the greatest nation on earth. And, you know, <laughs> and we, we tried to get away with that when we didn't know the answers back when I, in, the, in the 60s when I was in, in, in school. Now it's that well, Andrew Jackson made a war, war on the bank because America's the, the worst and most racist uh, and he was racist, by the way, and, and you know, it, it's the new, do, I call it the new default. It's a new kind of ignorant reflex. But leave that aside for the moment and, and, uh, and talk about the 1619 Project. I, I think this, this was a, basically a journalistic gimmick uh, uh, hatched by a journalist at the New York Times. There are very few reputable historians that have been willing to sort of step forward and say, I... I believe in the 1619 project. And there have been a number of very prominent ones, all, all people on the left uh, who have said, this is just nonsense. This is, uh, it, it, this simply doesn't, is not his, historical. Um, so, uh, and there are people who I think understand that the, you know, the complexity of human history, is, and this is really what you're pointing to with this compared to what uh, argument. I use this all the time with my students. I'll say, you know, they'll, they'll make some sweeping comment 
from a, a sort of moral standpoint derived from an abstraction. And I'll say, okay, compared to what? Compared to, and, and they don't know anything about any of the specifics. They just know that George Washington owned slaves and therefore QED. Um, but so, so if you press them about that, what about other countries? What about other times? And, and you bring up the point that slavery has been a mainstay of most societies at most times in human history. It is more, it's a terrible thought, but it's much more the rule than the exception in human history. What's exceptional is a country, uh, a people that, uh, that in, in some sense acquires the institution, not in a very self-conscious way, but in a haphazard way. And, um, and, 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 ult and, defines itself uh, uh, dependent as the Southern states were on, on that, or I believe it was economically dependent. And yet the nation freed itself uh, from it. You know, the first serious modern anti-slavery movement did not uh, originate in Europe, it originated here um, in New England. <laughs> so, uh, and this is something that Sean Willens, who's one of the major critics of the 1619 Project, always points out that uh, that uh, he's and, and he's no conservative by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, but that this is a real slander uh, to act as if we have been particularly uh, evil in human history. When Columbus arrived in the New World, slavery was already there. Uh, it was already there in the Indies, um, and uh, he didn't invent it. He, he was he I, look. He had uh, he was a cruel uh, slave master. We know we know a lot about that. I mean, Columbus was a complicated man, but complicated is not the same thing as make, making him a demonically evil man. That's that's wrong. That that's not good good history. That's not nuanced history. Uh, one of the things I try to get across is that all of us, are, we're flawed creatures. That, oh, sorry, I, I turned off my light. We're flawed creatures, uh, I just illustrated this. Uh, and we're motivated by a variety of, of uh, uh, factors. Uh, some of them admirable, some of them not. Um, a man like Jefferson is, uh, is very complicated. And yet, uh, and this really comes back to your point, I think, the, the, the compared to what point. Um, Jefferson is admired all over the world uh, today for his words, for the words of the Declaration of Independence and, and, uh, and other documents of liberty, which he penned so, so beautifully, so memorably. Um, you know, just, uh, just months ago, and it's a sad thing to recall, but just months ago when the streets of Hong Kong protesters were carrying statues of liberty and 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 uh, citing the words of Jefferson. Uh, uh, John Lewis, the, the great civil rights leader, uh, gave a speech in, in, once in which he said, look, we knew about Jefferson's uh, slavery uh, his, his, and, and his ambivalence about slavery in his own life. But that wasn't what we cared about. We cared about his words and they were the fountain of liberty for us, and the, and they can continue to be for others. I, I'm just quoting from memory there, but it's 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 a not uncharacteristic view of well, up until you know very recently, and then we have this turn towards a kind of hard, um, un, unhistorical, uh, and really in a way inhumane uh, view of the past uh, that that's sternly judgmental and sternly committed to sort of uh, payback and righting of wrongs or reparations, things that uh, correction of the past, that's something we actually never can do. Um, what we can do is try to understand it and learn from it, but we can't uh, settle the accounts of the past. That's not given to us to do. That's, that's God's, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Well, one of the great themes of Land of Hope is that it's a land of hope. And you write in the book, um, something that I took away from it was when the United States is an aspirational country, it is founded on aspirational ideals. Um, and that where you have hope, you also have disappointment because 
of the struggle to live up to, to the hope. And so I think that's just a great scene setting that you have in the beginning of, of your book to talk about um, that dichotomy and that constant struggle in US history to live up to the ideals and that it's a, it's a work in progress and always has been and, and likely always will be. And that as a historian, that's what you sort of look back at and try to grapple with and understand, not yeah. to apply yeah. our values in a uh, judgmental way, but to try to understand the struggle. And I mean, Jefferson's a great example of an, you know, encapsulated in one individual of that struggle with the uh, inheritance and the realities and the awful part um, while still trying to reach those ideals. We have a, um, a, a question really quickly from one of the folks. Uh, we have a political science professor in the audience um, who has asked, um, he's been teaching. Um, oh, I see the question, yes. A couple um, of decades um, and wanted to know um, the implications of a growing segment of our population not knowing and not caring about the founder's vision for America is of great concern. Um, civic literacy, this um, is the new norm. Um, that level of uh, declining civil literacy, do you see anything in your work to suggest there's hope in a reaffirmation of founding principles in the spirit of 76? Or is it more gloomy than that? Um, <laughs> well, I think it's, it, it, I, I'm, I'm a bit gloomy too, although I think there are some good things happening that may bear fruit. There's a lot of interest in civic education. And it's interestingly, it, it's sort of, as they say, about both sides of the aisle. Although I, 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 a lot of what I've seen so far has been a little bit disappointing. Uh, it, it, I and, and my publisher and others are trying to do our part, not just with Land of Hope, but, but we're working on a, I'm still working on this, but we're working on a curriculum that, that uses Land of Hope that can be, um, used in, in the schools and and actually I did I'm, I've written it hasn't been published yet but I've written a young readers edition of Land of Hope that will be used with fifth graders and uh, so they'll uh, and it's really pitched towards I mean the book is pitched towards uh, the education of citizens um, it, 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 there's a lot that's not in there I mean for example um, the, the I don't do a lot with social history which has been one of the growth areas in historical writing over the last 40 years or more, but but I, I think these are things that you uh, that are secondary in importance to understanding how our institutions came into being, why they took the form they did, uh, how they operate, you know, and uh, and how they have operated in particular historical instances in the past. Why why did the Constitution break down in essence in the 18 60s, 1850s and 1860s, um, and how can we you know, prevent that from happening again? Um, among many, many other things, and and and, um, and I also try to give students something very much missing from textbooks. That is a sense of the difficulty of being a leader. You know that leaders, and, and of course, someone like Lincoln is a prime example, but not only Lincoln. Uh, leaders are faced with choices that are not a choice between an ab abstract good and an abstract evil. <laughs> Life doesn't do you that, that, that favor. Um, it's, it's a choice between greater and lesser evils, between uh, um, partial goods and, 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 and partial evils, and weighing them and balancing them and trade, doing trade-offs. And that's, that's what, the way leaders have to think. And I, I hope that, um, this is a, an, an element of civic consciousness: is to be aware of what of what kinds of dilemmas our our leaders face, um, but and, and that that's part of the civic knowledge that the questioner uh, is so concerned about our having lost. That, that, and, and it's true: We're, we we have everybody vocal in the public square is is, is absolute and unyielding in their claims. You know that they they have. They have some sort of absolute um, claim to the righteousness of their cause, and they, they 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 won't give an inch, and they're going to shout about it and protest about it and burn things down about it. And, um, there's there's not a sense of the, the fact that without the rule of law, without fundamental canons of civility, 
none of these other freedoms are going to be worth anything in the long run. That, that we have to have that fundamental structure in place and, and affirm it um, to be able, able to progress in other areas. So, so, but back to the question, what, what, what's being done? Yeah, there are a couple big initiatives out there. there there's so, um, uh, uh, and, and I, I'm not entirely happy any of the ones that are, that they're out there now, but I think in time we can we can work with them and and maybe uh, look. I think parents are concerned. One of the few good things about the pandemic has been the the um, pitiless gaze <laughs> that um, has been focused on exactly what is going on in our public schools, particularly public schools. Not only public schools, um, private schools are emerging as a you know, probably elite private schools like the Dalton School in New York. Um, uh, and I think that, that people are becoming aware that this sort of endlessly um, critical view of our history is at the very best one-sided. Of course, uh, you want to be cognizant of our failures, but how about being cognizant of our successes? How about being cognizant of our achievements? How about being cognizant of the fact that race relations of this country have progressed in enormous ways? Um, but let, let me add something to the questioner's question that, that I'm concerned about. It's, and maybe, maybe he is, um, has this in mind or something like this in mind too, but one of the things I'm struck by is all the statistics that I see about um, how, un, how really, really unhappy and unmoored our young people are. You know, I have, I have uh, kids are a little older, but uh, you know, I, I see it in my classes. I see a kind of demoralization about their life prospects, which I think is not unconnected to the way they're being taught about the nature of the, their history and the nature of the regime they live under. I mean, one statistic that just comes to my mind and I, have, I can give you a ream of others, but uh, uh, between 2007, I think, and, two th and, and 20, 2018, in those, that 11 year span, the rate of suicide for young Americans between the age of, I think 10 and 24 has increased 60%. That's, that's a stunning statistic when you think about it. And in a, in a prosperous society, I mean, they're not committing suicide because their stock portfolio went down in 2008. <laughs> they're not, it's, it's nothing tied to events. They're, they're, and I'm not saying there's, it's only because they don't know any civics or they don't love their country, but I think they are being taught um, to, to disparage their country in a way that ultimately, ironically, uh, is, um, is bad for their, for, their, for their souls. It's bad for their mental health, if you prefer. Um, and uh, I, I think that, that anyone who's taught that they're, that the society they live in and prosper in and try to move ahead in is fundamentally flawed, Fun, I mean, fundamentally racist, fundamentally evil, systemically evil. Um, they're not only being lied to because I think it's a false, uh, a false statement, but they're being crippled. They're being crippled at the beginnings of life by a view of the, the prospects that face them that, that is bleak um, and that, that uh, produces some of the downcast out to, uh, attitudes that I I described. So, well, and it, yeah, I, this is one of the things that we try to um, touch on sometimes at the Barlow Center is, um, and I'll give you an example, uh, you know, media coverage um, of the economy and of just life in general always, always focuses on the negative. And um, as a result, when you see polls done asking people um, about their view of, um, you know, uh, the economy or their prospects for the future, it's invariably skewed negative. Most people think yeah. that we live in, um, you know, extremely 
um, challenging bad before the pandemic, right? In, in bad mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. where hope is uh, hope is lost, and and they're very pessimistic, and um, it's a struggle to point out to them that they actually live in the easiest time in all of human history to ever live. Right? They were the, mo the, the richest, wealthiest, most tolerant, um, easiest time to be alive the humans have ever had. And yet they think it's the worst time to be alive. And uh, so this is something that we struggle with. And, um, and I think you're right that tying it, um, there is a, a, some sort of important connection there to the way we teach yeah. history and teach about our culture. And so, um, but that disconnect between the media is also a disconnect with social media. And that brings me to a question that we have from uh, one of the folks in the audience. Um, and he asked, do you find it challenging to spread a message of hope through social media when messages of blame and victimhood are so much easier to share and so dominant? Well, I, social media is something I, uh, I avoid. Um, <laughs> I'm not on uh, Facebook. I was briefly on LinkedIn because one years ago with one of my students pleaded with me that it was essential to her future that, that I, for reasons I didn't quite understand, I said, okay, okay, okay. And I got on it and it was a big waste of time and or a small waste of time actually, not even a big waste of time. But, but then I started getting inquiries from people I didn't know about. Could I do them a favor for this or that? And I thought, oh, this is a, I, I don't need that. <laughs> So, um, so I've never been on Facebook or Twitter or uh, anything like that. Um, but, but stay but, off Twitter. I can just tell you, it's accessible. I, stay off Twitter. It is. No, I think. Look, I'm not. I don't need to be convinced about that. But um, and and of course, you can't avoid exposure to it because even you know, I love to read uh, Glenn Reynolds's Instapundit uh, web weblog, and uh, um, and he a lot of times he's posting Twitter you know tweets yeah. by people. So I'm I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not unfamiliar with it, but I, I think, uh, it, and there are people I think who do a good job of of using those media for relatively good purposes. Uh, they're probably in a distinct minority, and it may well be that the medium um, is is inherently corrupting of any kind of expression you try to engage in. The same way that you say, I'm going to write a really intelligent bumper stickers. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, a bumper sticker is a bumper sticker. And uh, to explain why our constitution looks the way it does to, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is, is uh, you know, going to be a real challenge because you have to communicate in bumper stickers. Um, uh, but, but, um, I, so I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, Land of Hope, I, one of the reasons I wrote it the way I did was, was to sort of be countercultural. It's, it is a, it is a textbook, but it reads like a regular book and it's meant to be read. Um, yeah, one of the fears I had in the early going is we sold so many copies to adults. <laughs> I thought maybe kids are not going to be interested in this book at all. And when we finally start trying to sell it to schools and happily that has not turned out to be a problem but um uh i think that, that and just being a book is just being a book at all because you know in most schools i think we're going to see very quickly um the uh, pearson uh, is the biggest textbook publisher they've mm -hmm. gone all digital yeah you, know, you have to specifically request a hard copy uh, otherwise, the school gets access to the platform. Mm -hmm. And it all sounds so wonderful. You know, it, 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 any new editions can, will just automatically go in the system. You don't have to get a new edition of the book. Um, yeah, it's, but it, to me, it makes me think of, of the, you know, George Orwell, 1984, you know, the, 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 the ease with which manipulation of, the, of information about the past becomes routine. In the yeah. Ministry of Truth. Uh, so, um, I like there's something about the permanence of a book. Um, oh, sure. That, 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 so, so uh, fortunately, my publisher agreed with this, and uh, and a lot of people out there are agreeing with it. That that. Um, so, in a way, I'm evading the question rather than answering it. But, but I don't, I don't know of a good way to use social media. Yeah. To do anything but maybe point people towards the books. That they ought to read. I I, I don't. Um, 
I don't see a substitute for longer forms of uh, you know, of literacy as ways of uh, educating. You know, it's not a coincidence, and this is a much longer, deeper discussion, but it's not a coincidence that modern democracy arises in tandem with the develop development of, uh, of uh, cheap, you know, printed materials mm -hmm. that are widely available. Um, just as it's not a coincidence that Reformation arose when uh, the, the Bible could be uh, translated into vernacular tongues and printed and made widely available. It, it changes the whole, uh, you know, the access to scripture of the average person. Uh, it makes Martin Luther possible. Um, right. Well, so, I can tell you, um, I really enjoyed reading the, the paper book. Um, and there there is such a, it's funny to think of paper being permanent um, because it's so delicate um, and vulnerable. And yet I still have my college textbooks from the 1990s, um, my, yeah. my US history books. And, you know, I was flipping through one of them, um, you know, just a general survey uh, textbook. And one of the things I really liked about Land of Hope is that it is a narrative. You, you have a theme and there's a coherence. It doesn't read like a textbook. It's not disjointed. You connect the different uh, parts of American history through this narrative. Um, and oh, thank you. That's what I tried to do. I, I'm, you know, you, it works really well. Judge whether you're successful. Um, and I compared it to the college textbook I had, you know, when my freshman year, which is disjointed and full of pull out photos and, and it has probably it's about the same size as your book, but probably has 40 percent as many words because there's so many graphics and pictures. Yeah. Um, and you really pack a lot into this book. So um, I, I recommend it for anybody who wants a good um, survey, a good overview of American yeah. history and a, and a good narrative. There's lots of stuff in there. Um, there's lots of wonderful surprises. Uh, when I was reading your chapter on self-government, I got to the end and I was sitting beside my wife and I laughed out loud and she was didn't know what I was what was happening. And I said, well, um, I got to this point in the chapter and I thought, God, this would be a really good um, place to quote Levi Preston. And then there was a, Levi Preston <laughs> was, for those of you who don't know, was a Revolutionary War soldier who was interviewed in his 90s and had this wonderful um, interview about why he fought. And I won't spoil it. You can look it up. Um, yes. But you, you just include a lot of charming little things in here. Um, your chapter on or your section on the Emancipation Proclamation and Lincoln's decision making and how um, we can misunderstand that if we don't really understand the context of what he was trying to do with his constitutional view is just really important. So um, so I recommend the book. I think it's um, a really good overview of US history. And for those of you who are looking for something to maybe um, get some kids into or just want a refresher yeah. for yourselves, um, it's a good adult refresher as well. So, um, and at that, we have kept our audience for an hour, which wow. is um, impressive. So, <laughs> I, I want to go ahead and, and thank you, uh, Professor McClay, for coming and joining us. Um, this was a really wonderful talk. I would I, I, enjoy another yeah. hour of it, but I know people have dinner to get to. <laughs> yeah, you all are uh, ahead of me. I'm out in Central Time, but uh, 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 I, I really, I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed, you know, I even enjoyed being flying solo there for a little while. I wasn't <laughs> quite sure where it was all going to go, but I was ready to keep going. I, I had some ideas in the back of my head well maybe i'll do this maybe we'll do that so, uh, so but thankfully you came back and, yes well sorry about the technical glitches there well um, this is uh we live with these i mean I, I i almost every one of these things i do it has some technical glitch but yeah uh, but we persevered yes and, uh, the reason to trust books yes yes well, you you keep you keep them on their toes up there in the granite state we need we need you all to be you know um as, as granitic as possible <laughs> in, in commitment to your principles. Uh, well, so, you know, our, in thinking of, you know, the, the American expansion and the westward expansion, you know, our, our little um, dream here is to um, export um, New Hampshire's way of life, the, the live free or die ethos um, to the rest of the country. You know, I, that's our imperialism. That, that we want. would be so great. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, uh, it, 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 it's it's a wonderful state and, and, and it has always been a kind of beacon. I, I mean, I grew up with the 
the whole the William Loeb and the Manchester Union. Oh my goodness, which, yeah. Which was a really, uh, you know, uh, quite quite different from the uh, what we thought of as the mainstream media at that time. I'm not sure you have anything like that in, in now, but uh, but you sure, sure got a room for enterprise. I mean, that's it's it's a much more enterprising state than many, yeah, an enterprise friendly state than many, including Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a, a long way to go. And, and the taxes are too high. It's uh, Oklahoma, you would think would not be as hospital an environment for a free market think tank, but they have a lot of work to do there. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a good way to put it. It's a hospital environment for a free t free market think yeah. tank. And and they are they are and, and and they're very good. I think OCPA is is terrific. Mm -hmm. um, so well, uh, I, I uh, thank you all. I think our, our audience is still there. My goodness, yeah, uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, and that's just a you know a testament to your ability to hold their attention. So um, well, thank you again for joining they, us. They hold my gratitude. So <laughs> uh, hope to meet you someday in person, Drew. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Maybe we'll have you up um, and uh, do an event in person one day. Are you in Concord? Um, yes, our office yeah. is here. Yeah, no, wonderful town and wonderful, yeah. wonderful place. Okay. Right, well, good luck. Bye, everyone. Good and um, thank you again. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, we appreciate it. And this is the last of our um, six month worth of Libertas virtual events. We hope you've enjoyed them. So um, um, we're wrapping up in May with the hope that maybe we'll get to do in person events sooner rather than later. So that is what we're going to shoot for. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. And um, anybody wants to check us out, we're jbartlett.org. So thank you so much. And um, you can get Land of Hope at any reputable bookseller. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, Barnes and Noble um, stocks it. Uh, they've been great about that. And uh, you can get it from uh, that company named after a river in South America that I, I, <laughs> that I think we I should. I one that could be. I think I think we ought to avoid for a while. Myself. But we have um, that's an option. We do have a Barnes and Noble in Manchester, and we have some independent bookstores around. That um, if they don't carry it, maybe you could call them, uh, your local independent bookstore, and yeah. ask if they can get it for you. It, incidentally, Bar Barnes and Noble is now run the the, the if you, if you want to order online from them instead of that company, the name I just can't think of right now, but. Uh, um, uh, it's owned and run by a, a free market oriented conservative uh, whose name escapes me. Uh, it's, it's, uh, he's not named Amazon, I'll tell you that. Uh, I can't think of his name. Uh, but um, that, that, you know, that, there you go. We have a bookstore book as well. Ordering from, from Barnes and Noble. Uh, All right. Yeah, you, well, can you, you, can. you can get it from that other outfit too. And, and, and there are uh, bookstores that have it. Uh, it's published by Encounter Books. Mm -hmm. You should have mentioned that, and and you could go to Encounter Books website. Yeah, you can get it directly. Yeah, get it directly. Um, All right. Okay. Well, um, thank you again, and for your time and for this great discussion. And uh, maybe we'll catch you in person one day. Thank you. Thank you. All Thanks right. to all of you. Bye bye. Thanks everybody. Bye.